12 o'clock on Wednesdays, looking forward to seeing you. Come join us Wednesdays for lunch. And welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning, everybody. I'm here with my good friend, Gene. He's going to do a song for you, and I want to set it up. You know, in this world, we are the feet and we are the hands of Jesus. And sometimes something happens, and all we do is we say, well, let's pray about it. But there ought to be some work that we do. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we need to act like the feet and the hands of Christ in this world. And you know, Jesus was a collector of broken souls. Look at his disciples. The people he picked up were broken from this world, and he decided that they were worth saving, and he used them. I think Gene's going to tell us about a little girl named Maggie who did the same. There you go. And left arm and a right foot and I hanging by a thread Carried it gently up to her room Laid it on her bed With her other dolls She loves the broken ones The ones that need a little patching up She looks for diamonds in the rock And makes them shine like new it really doesn't take that much A 
willing heart and a tender touch If everybody loved like she does There'd be a lot less broken Twenty years later in a shelter on 18th Avenue A seventeen-year-old girl turns up all black and blue With needle tracks up her left arm almost too weak to stand She says, I'm lost and I need help Maggie takes her by the hand and says, come on She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She looks for diamonds in the rough and makes them shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Call her an angel, she'll be quick to say to you, she's just doing what the one who died for her would do. Love the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up, look for diamonds in the rough, and make them shine like new. It really doesn't take that much. A willing heart and a tender touch If everybody loved like she does If everybody loved like he does There'd be a lot less broken This morning in our prayer time, you're going to need a couple of things. You might want to push pause after I tell you what they are and gather them up. You're going to need a photograph, okay? Some photograph that means something to you in your home. Collect that. Secondly, you're going to need a pen and a post-it note or a small piece of paper. So collect that, please. And then we'll start our prayer time. The first thing in this prayer is I want you to think about that photo you hold. I don't know what you picked. It could be something from your past. And if it is something from your past, then I want you in this prayer time, in the silence that I give you in just a moment, to thank God. Maybe it's a picture of your parents. Maybe it's a picture of somebody who's departed from your life. And just thank God for them. But you may have picked up a picture that is of your family, of your children. Well, in this case, I want you to say a prayer for them. I want you to think about their specific needs, where they're at in life. Are they 18? Are they 35? Are they 52? Think about their needs and say a prayer. In this silence, pray. Let that picture guide you to give thanks or to pray for someone. Let us be silent for just a moment. There's no silence in my backyard, just too many birds. Now I want you to take that pen and that piece of paper, okay? And I want you to write down the names of two people. You are probably watching this from home, so there are probably some people in our congregation that you haven't seen, maybe even family members that you haven't seen. But I want you to write down the two names of somebody that you haven't seen in a while. Just go ahead and write their names down. All right, now I want you to take a moment in this silence that I give you, except for the birds singing in the background, and pray for them. Think about their concerns and their lives, the weights that they carry, and pray for them. The two names that you wrote down, let us pray.
And the final part of this prayer is take those two names, get their phone numbers, and give them a call today. Put some feet to your prayers and brighten somebody's Sunday afternoon up by giving them a call. Not a text, let them hear your beautiful voice. Good morning. You may remember that during the Advent season, we read the appropriate John the Baptist material. That prompted two of our members to privately correspond with me about John the Baptist. They wanted to learn more. And so I spent some time talking to each of them about the life and the death of John the Baptist and historically how we view him. I spent a lot of time reviewing the Baptist material, and I will say this, that was a great experience for me. I found John's life even more colorful than I originally thought. Now May begins Mental Health Awareness Month. And you know, a year ago, we may have thought that, well, it's great to have a Mental Health Awareness Month. and. It's a great thing to do for some people. But, you know, after a year of living with COVID, I think we all must admit that mental health awareness is not about others. It's about us. We all struggle and we all have struggled during this year with the changes and it has affected our mental health. And any objective review of the material of John the Baptist raises concerns about his mental health. As we review the John the Baptist material this morning, I think it's going to feel very familiar. Possibly it's even a template of what it means to follow God and yet at the same time be fully a broken human. Now the following is an edited version for sermon preparation of my correspondence with these members. I hope you will find it inspiring. And the first section is called Art and John the Baptist. John is a familiar subject in the art world. He has the type of death and life that makes him very alluring to an artist. Now this first piece that you're about to see is from an artist named Simeon Martini, an Italian painter in the 1400s. If you can't tell, John's in the foreground on the left. Now, Martini, nor any artist of this era, gave people big old smiles. But I want you to look at John. Look at him compared to the others in the photograph or the painting. Art is not simply something we view. We interact with art. So let me ask you, does John seem sad? Does he seem lost? You know, if he is sad, is he sad because he's malnourished? Or is he sad because he lives out alone from people? Or maybe he doesn't like being playing a second fiddle. Now this next piece is from an artist named Rene. Rene was an Italian painting during the Baroque period. He painted a lot of pieces of John the Baptist. 
Now, people have read the John Baptist material and wonder if John was mentally stable or mentally ill. If someone exhibited John's behavior today, how would they be treated? It's easy to think we could or would diagnose John, but how would he be treated today? Would we treat him any better than he was treated in his own day? I mean, does it appear to you that since we have more drugs to aid with mental illness, that we've become less forgiving to people suffering from mental illness? I mean, take a look at his face in this picture, in this painting, excuse me. John the Baptist, Isaiah, Elijah, it really doesn't matter. Most prophets had this feeling that they were the vessel of God. And that's not a privilege, that's a burden. This is a heavy weight to think that you speak for God. As one in this family of the called, I can sympathize. I can testify that at times the loneliness is unbearable. The fact that nobody else can really understand. The idea that you feel conviction like most people feel hunger and that you are accountable to God, well, this is not a gift. Loneliness is real for John, and you can see that in his eyes and in his gesture. Being close to God as he was, it actually makes others want to keep their distance. And the same is true today. Nobody wants to get too close to a holy person. The second section is about the scripture. Now the following are the relevant passages of John's life recorded in the Gospels. I make a few brief comments, but mostly I'm going to read to you the text. And I've lined them up as best I can chronologically. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Now this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. Well, they ask, well, what then? Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you a prophet? He said, no, I'm not. Then they said to him, well, who are you, sir? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you're neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor a prophet? And John said, Well, I baptize with water. And among you stands one whom you do not know yet, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong on his sandals. And all of this took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him, and he declared, Here is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he who I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he's always been before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Now I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain 
is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now Mark has another version of this same story. It's not the whole story, but it's the ending about the baptism. And I want to read that to you. And I want you to look for the difference between Mark's version and John's version. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. Thinking about John's mental health, you see, in the Gospel of John and Mark, both have a version of the Spirit coming like a dove. But only in Mark's version is a voice heard at the baptism. Was this voice heard by everybody? Or just by Jesus? Or just by John? You know, John the Baptist does see visions. And some might say he's hallucinating. In John's Gospel, what John the Baptist saw was the Spirit of God. It swooped down like a dove. The Spirit was not a dove. Now, over in Luke 7, the story continues. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another. John's having his doubts about Jesus. Having a spiritual crisis or a crisis of faith is not unusual. John the Baptist even has one. Go to the Lord and ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. It had given sight to many who were already blind. And he answered them, Go, tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. See, John's crisis of faith, well, it starts here. John begins to have his doubts about Jesus, if Jesus is the real deal. Now, a crisis of faith is natural. Humans have them. If you're living through one, don't panic. You've had health crises, and you still go to work, and you still pick the kids up after school. A faith crisis is similar. Just keep carrying on. Keep coming to church, serving people, raising your family. I'd say this crisis is a sign of John's humanity. It is not a sign of any sort of mental deficiency. The comfort Jesus offers is a list of signs. Now, the speculation is, the text doesn't say it, but the speculation is that John himself cannot come to Jesus because he's in jail. So why doesn't Jesus come and spring John loose? That's probably what John really wants. Especially if Jesus is giving sight to the blind and making the lame walk, can't you imagine what John's thinking there in the jail cell? Where's my blessing? I've been a faithful servant. This sounds like the natural wonderings of a man in prison and losing hope. Which brings us to Mark 6 and why John's in prison in the first place. Mark 6, beginning with verse 17. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have married your brother's wife. Don't be confused yet. I'll tell you when to get confused. Herodias is a woman. And yes, she is married 
to a man named Herod. And yes, there was another husband named Philip. Now you can get confused. We're not sure if Herodias had been lured into Herod's bed and away from Philip, or if Philip was already dead. Further, we don't know if Philip is dead at the hands of his brother or not. And you thought John had some mental instability. We know that Herod's first wife, her name was Phacillus. It is said he divorced her to marry Herodias. John the Baptist was outspoken about both the divorce and Herod marrying his brother's wife. And that's why he's in prison. Back to the scripture. And Herodias had a grudge against John, <laughs> you think? <laughs> and she wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed by John, yet he liked listening to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his court and officers and the leaders throughout Galilee. When his daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I'll give it to you. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out to her mother and said, what should I ask for? Okay, let's just stop here. What kind of dance gets a man so worked up to give half of his kingdom away? I think you got a pretty good idea of what kind of dancing we're talking about here. And what daughter dances this provocatively for her father with her mother's blessing? Again, you thought John the Baptist had some issues. Back to the text. The mother replied, I'd like the head of John the Baptist. Immediately, the daughter rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guest, he did not want to refuse her. He had painted himself in a corner. He didn't want to look weak. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him, brought his head on a platter, gave it to the girl, and then the girl gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard about all this, they came and took John's body and laid it in a tomb. I'm not kidding about Herod's mental health. I mean, who does this sort of thing? This is an entirely another sermon, but there's something going on here. But John, is John mentally unstable? I, I don't think so. Maybe he's eccentric, possibly on the spectrum a bit, maybe even depressed. I think that we could probably make that case. He had some mental health issues, but I don't think he was unstable. Which brings us to the final and concluding section of this, art and the death of John. The climax of the John the Baptist story, maybe even the reason he is so revered, is due to the manner of his death. The first work you're about to see is from a French artist, Gustave Moreau in 1874. The name for Herod's daughter is Salome, and here you can see her dancing. The second piece that you see is the same artist, same period of time, but the scene is different. This time you could see that Herod is sitting on the far left. The musician is behind the scenes. And John's head is not on a platter, but suspended in air. And if you look closely, you can see splatters of blood on the ground. 
Now this piece is a more modern piece, actually done in 2005. The artist's name is Dennis Gourvet. A much more modern feel. You can see all the men up at the table, represented probably as it was. It was probably an all-male gathering. Herod here looks uh, a bit more Nordic or Scottish than you might expect at first glance. And the final piece in this collection about the death of John is, well, it's Salomon with the head of the Baptist by, and done in 1761 by Marino Salvador Malella. You can see how melancholy she looks. You see, followers of Jesus are not immune from depression, mental illness, or crises of faith. We're not even immune from being faithful to God and being abused for the privilege. John was imprisoned because he believed the truth should be told. And plenty of people do the right things, live the right way, and they end up drinking from the cup of bitterness. John wondered, if Jesus could raise the dead and heal the sick, why couldn't he come and break him out of jail? It's human to feel that God has abandoned us in order to care for others or that our prayers are being unheard. Even John the Baptist felt that way. Now, I suspect that we're all on the John the Baptist spectrum. Depressed, temporarily unstable, lonely, feeling forgotten by God, experiencing a crisis of faith, or drinking from the cup of bitterness. These are real places. But these are also places well-traveled. We have plenty of company on this road. We've all been there, even John the Baptist. We've all wondered why Jesus isn't showing up for us. Seems to be showing up for others, but not us. We've all spoken the truth, and it ended up costing us. We've all seen our carefully constructed worlds unravel. John, like us, is not divine. He's a human trying to follow the living God. Is the lesson of John the Baptist to not stand for something or to not walk with the Savior or to not anger the wrong people? I say, no, that's not the lesson. You missed the point. That's the wrong lesson. The lesson of John the Baptist is that in this world, troubling things will happen. Injustice will happen. You will be passed over for a promotion. Things like this happen. But here's the way Jesus answered this. I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world, just get ready, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Indeed, he did. Grace and mercy gives the Lord our God. Grace and mercy is He. Grace and mercy gives the Lord our God. Grace and mercy is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praise is to our King. Grace and mercy gives the Lord our God. Grace and mercy is He. Grace and mercy is the Lord our God. Grace and
Lord, we lay our lives before you. Lord, we lay our lives before you. Lord, we worship you. Go now and bear fruit for God fruit that will last. Go now and love the other and love one another because love comes from God. Proclaim God's salvation, remain in Jesus Christ, and like branches of a vine, draw your life from him. And may God, the vine grower, tend you and make you fruitful. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.